I'm, I'm covering for Jenny Waldo, the Windsor public health nurse. Um, she's away right now. So I'd like to introduce Paula Rains to discuss um, this workshop tonight that is also funded by the Department of Public Health. So this will be recorded. So if you guys want to watch it again or return back to it at a later date, you can on our website, I believe. And without further ado, thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, as she said, uh, my name is Paula Rains. I am a licensed practical nurse. Um, I'll just start with a little bit of information about myself. Um, I have a bachelor's degree from Slippery Rock University in something unrelated to nursing um, in exercise science and psychology. I worked for Aetna for about four years um, as an exercise physiologist. Um, and then I got laid off and went back to school for nursing. And that is when I became a licensed a practical nurse. I've been doing this for the past 15 years. Um, I've been at one job in Glastonbury for the, um, eight years, and then I moved to the job where I'm currently at, um, Central Connecticut Cardiologist. I've been there for the last seven years, and for the last four years, I would say, I've been the head nurse of that office. Um, so that's just a little bit of background about me. Uh, if you watch this presentation or attended last year, um, you might remember me because I gave the same presentation last year. Um, so anyway, let's get into what uh, BP monitoring at home is. Um, before we start talking about monitoring at home and how to do it correctly, I would like to talk about um, what blood pressure is. So we have a, a PowerPoint presentation, which we're gonna put up and we'll just talk about some of that. Okay. I can take over now. Yes. Okay. Okay, so what is blood pressure? Uh, the definition of blood pressure is um, the force of blood against the walls of your arteries. So obviously the more force there is in the arteries, the higher the blood pressure is going to be. There are two numbers that make up your blood pressure. The first number, the systolic number is the top number. And that number measures the force of blood as your heart contracts. And the bottom number, the diastolic number, that uh, measures the, the um, force when your heart relaxes and fills back up with the blood. So which number is the most important number? Uh, a lot of people ask. Uh, both numbers are actually really important, uh, the top number and the bottom number. However, uh, from a cardiac standpoint, they, cardiac doctors really like to look at the top number uh, because that shows signs of major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Research has shown that there are a greater risk for strokes um, and heart disease when your top number is elevated. So you can see on the presentation, I've highlighted the top number, uh, the 122 in red. So that is your systolic number. And again, the systolic number is when the force of the heart contracting and pumping blood throughout the body. Um, typically as we age and we get older, uh, the arteries begin to stiffen and that's because we typically will start to build up plaque in the arteries. So as we build up plaque in our arteries, those arteries get stiff and then it makes it a lot harder for them to deliver the blood throughout the body. Uh, I'm gonna diverge just quickly um, there is a test that shows what the amount of plaque buildup in your, your arteries is. It's called a coronary calcium score. It is a test that a lot of our doctors are now sending our patients um, to get. It's done by radiology. It's just like an ultras, um, ultrasound, like a scan. It's not invasive at all. Um, but it's a good test to have, especially uh, if you have hypertension, because this will show you how much plaque buildup you have in your arteries and um, it's good for anyone just to have just so you know if you have a plaque buildup then you might need to see a cardiologist for these concerns so that's just a little side note um, that 
you may want to at some point in time talk to your doctor about whether or not you want to or if they think it's important for you to get this kind of a test. Again, that's called a coronary calcium test. Um, so anyway, moving on, we're gonna talk about why it's important to keep blood pressure controlled. So nearly one out of two adults, so half of the adults in the United States uh, have hypertension. That's 116 million people have hypertension. The problem with hypertension is that a lot of people have undiagnosed hypertension. And the reason that is, is because hypertension often has no symptoms. So that's why we like to make sure that um, we are monitoring our blood pressure and we are keeping our blood pressure under control. Um, high blood pressure, it can influence the entire body, including your eyes, your kidneys, your heart, and your brain. Uncontrolled blood pressure can cause heart attacks, and can cause strokes and heart failure, loss of vision, and even memory problems. You need to monitor your blood pressure uh, if you have high blood pressure often because there are no symptoms, as I said before. Often people will feel fine all while, ha all while having high blood pressure. However, there are some people who have high blood pressure and have symptoms. So these symptoms um, you may experience could be things such as headaches, shortness of breath, problems with your vision. Some people even have chest pain and some people have dizziness. But remember, a lot of people have high blood pressure without having any symptoms. And for that, unfortunately, uh, blood pressure has gotten has been dubbed by the name, the silent killer, because so many people are walking around with high blood pressure and don't even know it. And as I just mentioned, it can cause strokes and heart attacks and all those things. So that's why we wanna just periodically um, check in and see what your blood pressure is. And I'm not saying that you have to monitor your blood pressure every day. Um, people who have high blood pressure should me measure their blood pressure often but people who don't have high blood pressure should still also monitor their blood pressure, um, you know, infrequently here and there, just to make sure that their blood pressures are not running high. So what are the stages of hypertension? Uh oh, what happened to my screen? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so stages of hypertension. There's your normal blood pressure, which is less than 120 over 80. Then you have your elevated blood pressure, which is 120 to 129, the top number, less than 80 on the bottom number. Hypertension one is 130 to 139 on the top number, 80 to 89 on the bottom number. Hypertension two is 140 over 90. And then we have what is called the hypertensive crisis, which is 180 or higher, over 120 or higher, um, which I believe there's a whole separate workshop on that because I gave that workshop last year. Um, but hypertensive crisis, that's when, you know, you need to contact your doctor right away. You might, might need to have changes instantly in your medications. You might need to even go into the hospital if you're at that stage. But those are the different stages of hypertension. Then we have factors that contribute to hypertension, such factors as your age. The risk of high blood pressure increases as we age for everyone. And until about 64, it is more common in men. But after age 65, it is more likely for women to develop hypertension. Race. High blood pressure is more common among people of African American or African heritage, and unfortunately at an earlier age than other heritages. So for people of African heritage, for women, it could be earlier than 64 for them. Um, let's see, and also in this race, it is also more common for them to have more serious complications, such as the strokes, the heart attacks, and the kidney failures. So we wanna make sure that when you're of that race, you are definitely keeping an eye on your blood pressure 
especially if you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure. Uh, your family history, which is self-explanatory, you can't get away from your genetics. Um, you know, if it runs in your family, most likely you're going to have high blood pressure as well. Um, your weight, the more that you weigh, uh, the more um, blood your, your body is going to need, the oxygen, the nutrients your tissues are going to need. So it means your heart's going to have to pump harder, going to have to work harder, and that will make your blood pressure go up. Uh, sedentary lifestyle, people who are inactive tend to have a higher heart rate so that your heart is working harder, so that your muscles become weak and they're not able to contract and pump as much blood out with each contraction. That forces the arteries to have to work harder. So that makes your blood pressure go up because remember the definition of the blood pressure is the force of the blood on the arteries. So if they have to work harder, the pressure is going to be higher. Um, smoking. Smoking and chewing tobacco can immediately raise your blood pressure temporarily, but it can also cause damage to the lining of the artery walls, causing them to narrow and increase your risk of heart disease. Your sodium intake, if you're taking a lot of sodium in your, in your diet, your body can retain fluids. So water follows um, sodium. So if you're taking in a lot of sodium, then you're going to retain a lot of that fluid within your tissues. So you want to make sure that you're having a low sodium diet. If you don't have enough potassium in your diet, potassium counteracts sodium um, in your cells. So if you don't have enough potassium in your cells, then you're going to build up sodium. And if you build up sodium, then of course you're going to retain that fluid and that fluid will make your blood pressure go up. So you want to make sure that you're not getting a lot of sodium in your diet and you have enough potassium in your diet. Um, alcohol, having more than one drink a day for women and more than two drinks a day for men may affect your blood pressure. One drink is equivalent to 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, or 1.5 ounces of 80 proof liquor. Stress can also affect your blood pressure. Um, of course, if your stress levels are high, it can temporar temporarily increase your blood pressure, but if you stay in that state over a long period of time, then your blood pressure obviously will stay elevated. Um, and in chronic conditions such as um, kidney disease, diabetes, and sleep apnea, all can make your blood pressure go higher. So on that list of contributing factors, there are some things that we can control and there are some things that we can't control. Um, Obviously, you can't control your race, you can't control your age, you can't control your genetics. Um, but you can control some other things like your lifestyle, your weight, your smoking, your alcohol, and your intake, and those sorts of things. So we want to make sure that we're counteracting the things that we can't control with the things that we can control. For instance, I have hypertension myself. I've had borderline hypertension ever since I was in my 20s. And if you remember, I said that I was an exercise physiologist, which means that I exercised for a living. And I was 20 years old. And even then, I still had borderline hypertension. But I'm of African heritage. And I have a family genetic of um, hypertension on my mother's side and on my father's side. So those, those were things that I couldn't control but I did not become hypertensive until I was no longer exercising on a regular basis because I was no longer in the field of exercise physiology. So the amount of time that I spent exercising decreased. I also got older, had no control over that. So I, that helped, that didn't help. And then, you know, once I had children and you know, my lifestyle changed and that sort of thing, all those things that I didn't have control over, um, the blood pressure went up because I wasn't exercising anymore. I wasn't watching my diet. I wasn't changing the things that I could change so that my blood pressure stayed under control. So that's just one of the things. So you wanna just make sure that you want, you change the things that you can change to help with the things that you can't change, okay? So let's talk about um, uncontrolled blood pressure and what un uncontrolled blood pressure can do. So uncontrolled blood pressure can have complications, several of them on your heart. So 
the left ventricle can become enlarged called left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, and that is really important because the bottom chamber of your heart, the left side of your heart is really the powerhouse of your, of your heart because that part of the heart is what pumps the blood throughout your body to oxygenate all of your tissues. So if that's not working properly, then we have a problem. We wanna make sure that we can oxygenate the entire body. So when you have hypertension, that causes that area of your heart to enlarge and then it cannot pump the blood efficiently. So you wanna make sure that we're keeping our blood pressure controlled so that we don't develop that hypertrophy at the bottom part of the left heart. Another thing that uncontrolled blood pressure can do is cause coronary artery disease. So we have lots of arteries in our bodies, but the heart, the heart has its own set of arteries and those are called the coronary arteries. And so coronary artery disease is when those arteries are affected. So damage to those arteries they supply the blood or the blood to the heart. So when you have damage to those, it can cause lots of things like the heart attacks and the strokes. Um, high blood pressure can cause a hardening and thickening of those arteries and lead to those things. High blood pressure can lead to aneurysms. And aneurysm is a weakening or a bulging, okay, in the vessels. And if that erupts, it's a big problem. You're gonna have to be rushed to the, to the hospital. Um, kidney damage is one of the things that high blood pressure can, can affect. Um, it can weaken the vessels of the kidneys and prevent them from working properly, which could cause then renal failure. And then that would lead into dialysis and all those sorts of things. So as you can see, it, blood, high blood pressure can affect so many other areas you know, of our body. Um, eye damage, thick and narrow and torn blood vessels in the eyes that can lead to vision loss. Memory problems and dementia, all of those things can be affected when we don't keep our blood pressure under control. Um, so how do we keep our blood pressure controlled? There you go, oh, there you go, okay. Um, there's several ways that we can, oh, Went too far, sorry. Um, several ways that we can, we can do that. Um, one of the ways is uh, pharmacological. So that's your medications, um, your diuretics, which are the water pills that make you um, release the extra fluid in your body. Um, then they have um, you know, calcium channel blockers and you know, all sorts of other different medications that help control your blood pressure. So those are things that you would have to talk to your doctor about whether or not you need to be on certain medications. Other things that we can do is prevention and self-care, eating a healthy diet. So there's a diet specifically designed for hypertension. It's called the DASH diet. It's the dietary approach to stop hypertension. Um, it is a high fruit, high vegetable, whole grain, low dairy product. So, um, we wanna make sure that we're eating lots of foods that are high in potassium, low in sodium. So if we're looking at high potassium foods, we're talking about bananas and apricots, orange juice and tomato juice, tuna and sweet potatoes, um, cabbage, spinach. There's a whole list, list of them. Um, I'm sure you can look them up on the internet. I happen to have this book that I think is really good because it breaks it down. I hope you can see it. It's called Hypertension or High Blood Pressure Explained. Um, it's just on Amazon. You can get it right off of Amazon. It breaks everything down in very simple forms. It has a lot of information about different foods that you can eat to help decrease your, your blood pressure. Um, those foods that I just mentioned that are high in potassium. It talks a lot about um, you know, nat naturopathic ways such as garlic and onions and um, celery, those sorts of things that all help to reduce blood pressure. Obviously, you're not gonna wanna just do that um, if, if you need more than that. Um, if you need medication, then obviously you should talk to your doctor about medication, but 
this is something that you can do on your own to help prevent you from getting high blood pressure. So again, if you need the name, it's hypertension or high blood pressure explained. That's the, the name of the book. Um, other things that you wanna do is just stay hydrated. Okay, that's one of the most affordable and effective ways to help lower your blood pressure. Um, if you have prolonged dehydration, then your vessels, they tend to tighten up over time and that can cause the body to continue to retain fluid. So we wanna make sure that we're drinking a lot of fluids um, and staying hydrated. You wanna make sure that you're getting at least 30 minutes of activity at least three days a week. So we're not living that sedentary lifestyle. If you smoke, you wanna cut out the smoking. If you're a drinker, try to reduce the amount of alcohol consumption. It's not to say that you can't have alcohol, of course you can. Uh, we just wanna to try to reduce the amount of alcohol that you consume. And then of course, maintaining a healthy body weight. Um, techniques for reducing your stress levels in your life, yoga, deep breathing exercises and meditation. All those things help to lower your blood pressure. So, you know, maybe you want to try to pick up a practice like that. So why should we monitor your blood pressure at home? Do I not have a slide with that? I don't, I guess. Um, so monitoring your blood pressure at home can help with early diagnosis for people who don't already have high blood pressure. Um, if you are monitoring your blood pressure at home and you notice a trend of high blood pressure, not a single high blood pressure, but if you notice a trend of high blood pressures, then you can talk to your doctor and say, hey, I've noticed that my blood pressure has been 140 over 86 for the last however long. Um, you know, can we talk about this? So you want to make sure that you're doing that. And now I say, um, I say a trend and not one blood pressure because your blood pressure is transient. That means it's going to change all the time. It's gonna go up, it's gonna go down. So we wanna make sure that we're looking at how it is at the same time every day or you know, however often you're taking it on a regular basis so that we can get an average of what your blood pressure is supposed to be or what it is. Um, when you are doing such things as taking your blood pressure on a regular basis, it can help decrease your health costs because you can call your doctor and then say, hey, I've noticed that my blood pressure is normally this on this medication, but all of a sudden it's jumped up to this or all of a sudden it's down to this. Um, and the doctor can just make adjustments to your medications uh, without you actually having to come into the office. So, you know, if you're on, you know, metropolol 50 milligrams and all of a sudden your blood pressure has dropped down and you're feeling dizzy and lightheaded, then you can just call the office because you've been monitoring your blood pressure at home and say, hey, my blood pressure is now 100 over 70 and I'm taking metropolol 50 milligrams and I feel dizzy and lightheaded. And then the doctor will come back and say, let's drop that metropolol down to 25 milligrams or you know, whatever it is that the doctor is going to say. Um, and that will save you the cost of your copay for coming into the office to talk to the doctor for him to say, let's just change your medication and see how that works. So that's a cost-effective way of um, why you should monitor your blood pressure. Um, again, it also helps to track your treatment to help determine what medication you're taking, if they're appropriate and that sort of thing. Um, it helps to encourage better control. It gives you a stronger sense of responsibility of your own health, okay? Um, you can check if your blood pressure differs outside of the doctor's office. So a lot of people know, like I hear it as soon as I come into the office um, or I bring a patient in, first thing I would say probably 80% of the people say to me is, I have white coat syndrome. So I already, let, already lets me know that they're telling me their blood pressure is going to be through the roof uh, when they come in. Um, and so we'll know that when they're monitoring their blood pressure at home, we'll know if they really do have white coat syndrome because at home, they give me a list of their blood pressure readings and at home, when they're taking their blood pressure readings, it's 120 over you know, 82 or whatever. And then I take it in the office and it's 146 over 90. I know, okay, let me let this person sit for a little while and I'll retake the blood pressure because obviously what I'm getting in the office is not jiving with what they've got at home. 
Um, so that's one of the reasons why you want to make sure that you are monitoring your blood pressures at home so you can let the doctor know, hey, this is not normal for me. You know, because if you come into the, the office and you've got white coat syndrome, but you've come in in January and your blood pressure is 146 over 96, and then you've come in in you know, June and it's still 146 over 96, the doctor's going to say, hey, we need to put you on some medication because you don't have any readings in between at home that says, this is not how I normally run. I, you know, but if you are monitoring your blood pressure at home, you can show us and say, hey, this is what it normally is. Um, so that's one of the reasons why you want to make sure you're doing that. Okay. So let's talk about the type of home monitors. Okay. So we've got two different types of monitors. We've got the, the old school monitor, I like to call it, which is the manual. Oh, it's got a physical thing here. Did I lose it again? Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> We've got the, the old school manual monitor. I just dropped something that was um, here where you put it on your arm with the stethoscope in the air and you pump it up and manually listen to it. Okay. Um, those are good. Kind of hard to do at home by yourself if you don't have anybody who knows how to use this machine or um, you know, if you're by yourself and you want to do it. It's not impossible to take the, the blood pressure with a manual cuff on your own, but again, just a little bit more difficult. When you are taking a blood pressure on your manual cuff, a lot of people will ask me, well, what am I listening for? How do I do it? So what you're doing is you're pumping it up, and when you no longer hear your heartbeats, you're going to start to release the valve. And when you hear your heartbeat, whatever number, corresponds on the dial that you hear, that's your top number. So when you, if you're at 130 and you hear your heartbeat, that's your top number. And you continue to release until you don't hear any noise anymore, when you can't hear the heartbeat anymore. And whatever number the dial is, it correlates to that, that's your bottom number. So if I stop hearing your heartbeat at 60, I know that your blood pressure is 130 over 60. So that's how you use a manual cuff. But again, manual cuffs, a little hard to do those on your own when you're by yourself. Okay, the automatic cuff inflates and releases air on its own. We've got an example of one of those two. This is what most people have at home. This is the manual cuff, okay? All you're gonna do is put the cuff on your arm and press the button and it's going to inflate on your own. And we'll demonstrate a little more and as soon as I'm done with all of this. So there are different types of um, manual cuffs, or I'm sorry, automatic cuffs. They have several different settings. Um, some will have um, singular settings like this one here has two settings. So you, you can take your blood pressures and store your readings and then you can click over to this person and somebody else can take their blood pressures and store their readings so that you're not getting the blood pressures confused. So, you know, they come in different ways, different sizes, um, different features. It all depends on how much money you want to spend. Obviously, the more features that the um, machine is going to have on it, the more expensive it's going to be. When you are shopping for a monitor, though, I will say uh, that you want to make sure that you are getting a validated um, machine. Omron is the one that we usually tell people to get, which is what they have here in the office. That's O-M-R-O-N. Omron is the name. Do you want to write that down? That is what we typically tell our patients in our office to get. But again, you know, you have to get what's in your budget. And they do have several different ones, you know, on different price ranges. Um, and then I have a website that you can also go to if you uh, want to see what are good validated blood pressures. And that's called Validate BP. That's one word, Validate BP, and the BP's in capital, dot org. So if you go on there, and they'll give you a list of um, monitors that you can 
you can see which ones have been validated. And you know, the reason you want to make sure that they're validated is you want to make sure that they're working and reliable and giving you the same um, readings over and over and over again. Okay. Um, the other thing with your monitor, let's say you have an older monitor um, and you want to make sure that it's still working. One of the things that we tell our patients to do is bring your monitor into your doctor's office, whether it's your cardiologist or your primary care or whomever, and have them take your blood pressure with the manual cuff in the office and then take it again with your, with your machine and see what the difference is between the two blood pressures. So you can see how accurate your blood pressure machine is. So that's one of the things that we also tell people to do. Um, so when you're shopping for your, your machine, there are several different ones. There's the ones that go on your arm. There's the ones that go on your wrist. Um, I even heard someone tell me that there's one that goes on your fingertip. I have not seen that. That's what someone said uh, when they call into our office. Um, I wouldn't recommend it if that's the case. If there really is one that goes on your fingertip, I'm not quite sure how valid or accurate that can be. Um, even the wrist ones are okay but it's better to have the one that goes on your arm, okay? When, if you do have a wrist one, make sure that you're holding it up to your, your heart level, okay? When you're taking a, a, a blood pressure on your wrist one, because that tends to be a little more accurate than the wrist. We really recommend though that you get the one that goes on your arm when you're doing it. Um, so when you're doing it, you wanna make sure it fits comfortably around your arm. So when you put this on, you want to make sure these home ones usually have a pretty big cuff on them so that you can hit several sides. You want to make sure that it fits accurately on your arm. It's not too big and not too small. And fitting on your arm properly like that. Okay. All right. You also want to make sure that um, you can read the display clearly, okay? So if it doesn't have a display that you can read, obviously that's not a good choice for you. Um, make sure it's cost effective for you, which I've already spoke about. Um, and then the other type of machines that they have are uh, the public machines, which I'm sure you've seen in the Walmart, in the, the Costco, in the, you know, the CVS and you know, whatever else. So those are good if you can't have, get a blood pressure to keep at home, but they do come with limitations uh, because might not be the correct cup size. Um, you might not be using the machine properly. And then we also don't know when the last time that machine was calibrated. So we don't know how accurate the readings are. Um, but I guess it's better than not taking any blood pressure at all. So. You can use those, but it would really be better for you to try to get a monitor at home, okay? So, Oop. yeah, there we go, perfect. Oh, was that my last slide? Okay. Um, all right, so, Let's talk about taking their accurate blood pressure. I guess we don't have to go to the slide anymore. I didn't realize that was the last one. <laughs> All right, so taking your, your accurate measurements. Um, you wanna make sure that you do not take your blood pressure first thing in the morning when you wake up because our blood pressure tends to be highest at night. And so it's higher in the morning when we first wake up. So you don't wanna take your blood pressure as soon as you wake up. Um, you wanna walk around a little bit, but you don't wanna to do too much, okay? Um, if you exercise in the morning, you want to make sure that you do not exercise before you take your blood pressure, okay? You want to take your blood pressure before you exercise. You do not want to eat or take your medications before you take your blood pressure. You don't even want to take over-the-counter medications um, before you take your blood pressure in the morning. And the reason being is because even some over-the-counter medications, they can also even affect your, your, your blood pressure. Um, NSAIDs can increase your blood pressure. NSAIDs are things like ibuprofen, those sorts of things. Those can increase your, your um, blood pressure. Um, cough medicines with the, like decongestants in it, like you know the, um, 
Robitussin DM, those sorts of things. Anything that has a decongestant in it, they always have that label, that warning on it about people who have high blood pressure. That's because it can increase your, your blood pressure. So people who have high blood pressure need to be careful about taking certain medications because a lot of things can affect the blood pressure as well. Um, you want to avoid the caffeine for at least 30 minutes before you take your blood pressure. Okay. You want to make sure that you empty your bladder. So you go to your bathroom before you take your blood pressure, because if you have a full bladder, it can actually increase your blood pressure by five to 10 points. So you want to make sure that you empty your bladder. So wake up, go to the bathroom, walk around a little bit, then sit down quietly and sit in a room for about five minutes before you take your blood pressure in a nice comfortable position. You wanna make sure that you have your feet planted flat on the floor. You're in a chair that has a nice back on it, okay? So you're sitting comfortably with your back rested and your arms are rested. <clears throat> sit with your arm raised at chest level, okay? I like to tell people with your palm facing up, okay? And you're gonna have the, the device on your arm. Okay, you're gonna place the, the cuff directly on the arm, not over the clothing, okay? Because over the clothing can change the accuracy of the blood pressure, okay? Also, if your shirt is too tight, if you have it, like people will come in the office and pull their shirt up and then it's like squeezing over here. Um, that's going to change your blood pressure reading as well. So if you can't loosely get that blood pressure up, it's better to just take your arm out the sleeve and take your blood pressure directly on the arm. Okay. Um, you want to make sure that when you are monitoring your blood pressure, you're monitoring your blood pressure at a consistent time on the, um, of the day, you know, in a consistent manner. You don't want to take your blood pressure several times a day because as I said earlier in the, in the program, your blood pressure is transient. So it's going to go up and down depending on the day, depending on what you ate, depending on how you're feeling, depending on, you know, who called you and, you know, ticked you off that day. So you don't want to take your blood pressure all of the time um, because it's going to go up and down. So I would suggest no more than two times a day if you're going to take your blood pressure maybe once in the morning after you've done all of those guidelines and maybe once in the evening. Now, obviously in the evening time, you're gonna, not gonna be waiting until you wake up because it's evening, so, but you're gonna wanna still sit in the room quietly. You're gonna still wanna sit with your feet flat. You're gonna still wanna sit in the chair with a nice back on it and have your hands elevated up to your heart level. You're gonna wanna still sit quietly for five minutes and empty that bladder before you take your blood pressure. So all of those things are still gonna be in place when you're monitoring your blood pressure. You're just doing it in the evening time. And then again, we're getting the average of the blood pressure, okay? So you don't have to take it in. You know, I came in, I came to work with, you know, a woman came in with like three pages of blood pressure readings and it was like a week's worth of readings. And I'm like, what is this? Yeah, because it's, it's too much. First of all, you're gonna hurt your freaking brachial out artery. That's, it's too much pressure on that poor little artery. Um, so don't do that. You're gonna drive me crazy, you're gonna drive doctor crazy, and you're gonna drive yourself crazy. So don't do that um, twice a day. That's really all that you need to do. So let me just show you again how to use the machine. So, I'm gonna take the, the cuff. You'll see here. There's usually directions right here on the cuff that will show you how to put the cuff on correctly, okay? When you put the cuff on, you wanna try to make sure that this cord is in line right here with the mid of your elbow. That's where your brachial artery is, and that's the artery that we're using to take our blood pressure. So we're gonna close this cuff up. Of course, it always twists around when you put it on by yourself. You're gonna pull it up. And I like to have it a couple inches above your artery here. And again, relaxing that arm. Now, I'm not quite at heart distance, but you know you want your arm to be relaxed and at arm distance. You don't want to be holding it up. It needs to be propped on something, okay? Um, but you want to have it at arm distance, sit nice and quiet and relaxed. You're just going to press the button.
Or maybe it's gonna go. There we go. And that's all there is to take in your blood pressure. And I just got my reading here, which is pretty high because I'm nervous. <laughs> all right, so really that's all there is to monitoring your blood pressure at home. Um, again, not first thing in the morning. Don't exercise before you do it. Don't eat. Don't take any medications before you do it. Make sure you empty your bladder. You're going to sit in that chair for you know five minutes quietly in, in a quiet, dark room if you can. If not, I mean, you know, that's not feasible for everybody, but if you can, um, a nice quiet room for five minutes, turn all electronics off, and then monitor the blood pressure. So that's all that I really have to go over. Does anyone have any questions? You did mention um, a trend. Mm -hmm. And um, so over what period of time would like a week's worth of readings, you oh. know, like you said, no more than twice a day or what, what's a good period of time to get a good trend? So if you have hypertension, then I would say um, give it about two weeks. If you don't have hypertension, then I would say give it about a month. If a month it's still running high, then call your doctor and let them know. Okay. Thankfully, I don't, but my, um, my parents do. Um, yeah, so, but they're 84 years old and, you know, so. Um, okay, so I want to start monitoring my, my father's readings. Yes. So, okay. okay. Great, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs>